The greatness of Carn School has been ascribed by common consent to Edward VI, whose educational zeal is ascribed by history to the Duke of Somerset. But Carn prefers the respectability of the monarch to the questionable politics of his advisor, drawing strength from the conviction that great schools, like Tudor kings, were ordained in heaven. And indeed, its greatness is little short of miraculous, founded by obscure monks, endowed by a sickly boy king, and dragged from oblivion by a Victorian bully, Carn had straightened its collar, <coughs> grubbed its rustic hands and face, and presented itself shining to the courts of the 20th century. And in the twinkling of an eye, the Dorset bumpkin was London's darling. Dick Whittington had arrived. Carn had parchments in Latin, seals in wax, and lamas land behind the abbey. Carn had property, cloisters, and woodworm, a whipping block, and a line in the doomsday book. Then what more did it need to instruct the sons of the rich? And they came, each half they came, for terms are not elegant things. So that throughout a whole afternoon, the trains would unload sad groups of black-coated boys onto the station platform. They came in great cars that shone with mournful purity. They came to bury poor King Edward, trundling handcarts over the cobbled streets or carrying tuck boxes like little coffins. Some wore gowns. And when they walked, they looked like crows, or black angels come for the burying. Some followed singly like undertakers mutes, and you could hear the click of their boots as they went. They were always in mourning at Carn, the small boys because they must stay, and the big boys because they must leave. The masters because mourning was respectable, and the wives because respectability was underpaid. And now, as the Lent half, as the Easter term was called, drew to its end, the cloud of gloom was as firmly settled as ever over the gray towers of Carn. Gloom and cold. The cold was crisp and sharp as flint. It cut the plate faces of the boys as they moved slowly from the deserted playing fields after the school match. It pierced their black top coats and turned their stiff pointed collars into icy rings around their necks. Frozen, they plodded from the field to the long walled road which led to the main tuck shop and the town, the line gradually dwindling into groups and the groups into pairs. Two boys, who looked even colder than the rest, crossed the road and made their way along a narrow path which led toward a distant but less populated tuck shop. I think I shall die if I ever have to watch one of those beastly rugger games again. The noise is fantastic, said one. He was tall, with fair hair. His name was Cayley. People only shout because the dons are watching from the pavilion, the other rejoined. That's why each house has to stand together, so that the house dons can swank about how loud their houses shout. What about Road? asked Cayley. Why does he stand with us and make us shout then? He's not a house don, just a bloody usher. He's sucking up to the house dons all the time. You can see him in the quad between lessons buzzing around the big men. All the junior masters do it. Cayley's companion was a cynical, red-haired boy called Perkins, Captain of Fielding's house. Oh, I've been to tea with Road, said Cayley. Road is hell. He wears brown boots. What was tea like? Bleak. Funny how tea gives them away. Mrs. Rode is quite decent, though. Homely in a plebe sort of way. Doilies, china birds. Food was good. Women's Institute, but good. Rode's doing cores next half. That'll put the lid on it. He's so keen, bouncing around all the time. You can tell he's not a gentleman. You know where he went to school? No. Drank some grammar. Fielding told my mama when she came over from Singapore last half. God, where's Branson? On the coast, near Bournemouth. I haven't been to tea with anyone except Fielding, Perkins added. You get to roast chestnuts and you have crumpets. You're never allowed to thank him, you know. He says emotionalism is only for the lower classes. Typical Fielding. He's not like a don at all. I think boys bore him. 
The whole house goes to tea with him once a half. He has this in turn, four at a time. It's about the only time he'll talk to most men. They walked on in silence for a while until Perkins said, Fielding's giving another dinner party tonight. Oh, he's pushing the boat out these days, Cayley said. Suppose the food in your house is worse than ever. It's his last half before he retires. He's entertaining every dawn, to all the wives, separately, before the end of the half. Black candles every evening, for morning. Hell is extravagant. Yes, I suppose it's a kind of gesture. Oh, my father says he's queer. They crossed the road and disappeared into the tuck shop, where they continued to discuss the weighty affairs of Mr. Terence Fielding, until Perkins drew their meeting reluctantly to a close. Being a poor hand at science, Perkins was unfortunately obliged to take some extra tuition this term in the subject. The city fills a great bowl in the steep Sierra Madre, the meeting place of three river canyons that the Chichimeca Indians called the Place of the Frogs. There were frogs here, and Chichimeca, for centuries, before the arrival of Spanish armies. Today, the only frogs are on t-shirts and the shelves of tiki-tac tourist stands. The Chichimeca have been bred away, or simply disappeared, into the immensity of the surrounding Mexican countryside. The name survived, altered slightly from Guanajuato to Guanajuato, a word so serenely Spanish-sounding that tour guides must remind the visitor of its Chichimeca origins. It is a mestizo name, a half-breed, hiding its native blood behind the pleasing sonority of a well-fed Castilian lisp. The basin holds a colorful patchwork of buildings, all of them forever under construction, four centuries of architecture tossed carelessly together like so many toys in a spoiled child's treasure chest. The rim of the canyon above is bare, an empty mountainous plain of scrub brush and rock, but below it the city presses up from the depths of the basin, surpassing the busy ring road, the panoramica, to reach the upper limit of the delivery men who hand carry heavy canisters of gas and agua into the crowded warrens of houses. It does not matter what day it is, always, as the late afternoon sun burnishes the ridge of the Cerro de Serena to the east, a series of cannon blasts echoes up the steep canyon walls, like rocks skipping on water, plonk, 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 further and further, until with a last dim splash they disappear. Puffs of smoke lift from the houses. It is impossible to tell who is firing the cannon or why. The scene is too closely packed and confusing. The blasts are followed shortly by the machine gun staccato of hundreds of schoolboys pounding on drums. Dressed in white and green, they are visible in glimpses as they serpentine their way down the hill into traffic. There is some kind of saint or a dead person laid on a bier with ribbons and candles at the front. Templo de San Francisco's rough stone towers catch the last sunlight, golden against blue sky. Birds lit from the plaza, disturbing the trash, and men pulling on long ropes ring the bells of the church. By the entrance to the tunnel, scores of trumpets mew like sick calves as the absent-minded boys keep pounding on their drums and traffic cools up behind them. It could be any day of the year. There is always a parade. Always the fugitive cannon blasts, always the haphazard ranks of boys in their school uniforms, raising a holy hell as the day tumbles forward. A pair of tall, slim figures move serenely through the din, patient, erect, waiting. Two ladies from Seattle. Their skin glows soft against the warm turquoise folds of their Indian wraps, the older one pauses before a tray of hand-painted trinkets. Her gaze is so steady she needs simply level it to possess whatever she sees. No need to reach out or touch. Sasha has one of these rings, the older lady says. 
I didn't know Sasha had ever been to Guanajuato. Her friend, the soothing one, answers, Oh, yes, I recognize that ring. Sasha got hers in Bali last Christmas when she went on that orphan bird mission. They gaze at the ring and then past it, the flocks of girls in pleated skirts and cardigans rushing by. Primary school girls, still in their uniforms, arms locked around each other's shoulders, and they imagine Bali, the thick jungle, the brightly colored birds. Bali? But it, it's Mexican. I can tell by the design, and of course, because we're in Mexico. No, no, I'm sure Sasha got hers in Bali. She was very proud of the find. Maybe it's from the same tribe. These indigenous people were quite mobile. <laughs> or or it's, it's one of those Rupert Sheldrake things. What do they call it? Oh, the morphogenic field, dear. Yes, it certainly looks like that. All of these native designs have that, that circular thing. And the tiny divisions, like, like a maze or something. They gaze together in wonder. Genius. And then they walk away. Fielding is having the Barkers to dinner tonight. I wonder if we can get an invite. Oh, I love the Barkers, but I can't stand that Fielding. He's so full of himself, always speaking in Spanish. And not even very good Spanish. No, no, I didn't think it was. That's why you can't understand him, dear. He gets all drunk and garbles everything. Half of it is French. The other half is <laughs> God knows what. But you like him, don't you? It was said as a statement of fact. You like it when he gets drunk and gossips. Oh, I like it very much. He's like some kind of character from La Carre, some tragic wreck of a brilliant mind. The pair smile at each other, pleased with the aptness of the image. Now they too would become characters in a book by Le Carre, the clever, knowing ladies who have this fielding all figured out. He's a reptile, so voracious. Oh, no, dear, he's just social. It was like tearing an oyster from its bed when he got moved over from San Miguel. He's just finding his footing again, sifting everything, making a place for himself so he can... She searches for the right phrase, the one with the right blend of hope and ambition and... Is it malice? The younger one, the soothing one, finds it for her. So he can make a home here. You know, I think I'll end it there so we don't go on too long. Uh, so, two starts, two books.